This is Sciographies, an introduction to the people who make science happen. I'm your host, David Barkley. I'm an oceanographer with the Faculty of Science here at Dalhousie University. And on Sciographies, I interview different types of scientists about what shaped their interests, their career path, and how they get their research ideas. Thanks for joining us. In this episode, we talk to Dr. Melanie Zerba. She's an associate professor in the School for Resource and Environmental Studies right here at Dalhousie. Her research in environmental governance explores a community's first approach to designing research projects with community partners. This bridges the gaps between natural sciences, social sciences, the arts, and equity-deserving knowledge systems. Dr. Zerba talks to us about doing research about research, tapping her creative side to leverage the power of art when working with community groups, and what collaboration between researchers and their Indigenous community partners can look like. So can you tell us a little bit about your prairie origin story of growing up in Winnipeg? Yeah, Uh, for sure. So I was born in Calgary, actually. okay. Um, But my folks moved to Winnipeg when I was two, so I'm really a Winnipegger. (laughs) Um, And then... At that time, my parents also split, so I was raised by a single parent um, in a very urban setting, um, right downtown Winnipeg, Mm -hmm. and uh, my grandparents also played a really big role in raising me, so that's why we bonded so closely. My mom did her best. You know, she went to university, and she got a degree, and my grandparents were there to support that, and Yeah. yeah. So you're living right downtown Winnipeg. Yeah. At the time, pretty rough around the edges. It's always been yeah. kind of a gritty place, mm-hmm. um, which is something that I love about Winnipeg too. It's mm-hmm. it's a very like real kind of yeah. <laughs> place to live. You know, it's yeah. not not polished. Um, sure. But I I always defend Winnipeg and and do love it as a place. Yeah. And there's I mean because of the type of place it is. There's so many people responding to social issues there yes. um, around truth and reconciliation and immigrant issues. And yeah, there's just a lot of great people doing great work there because yeah. of the type of city it is. Yeah. So that's what I was wondering yeah. about a little bit, how much of that experience of being from there, yeah. of being a Winnipegger, an urban Winnipegger, has contributed to the type of research you've done and how early that started. Were you an activist as a, in high school, for instance? <laughs> I was, I, but I was more on the environmental side of things. Okay. So I was in French immersion, and I was yeah. part of a group called Les Jeunes et Okay. and that was run by one of my favorite high school teachers, um, and it had a huge influence, I would say, mm-hmm. in my life. But I, I think social d- justice didn't really come into my trajectory until late in my undergraduate degree. Um, Mm -hmm. I was very much in the traditional kind of conservation paradigm. And so I followed that for a while. um, And that's why I took a biology degree Mm -hmm. focusing on wildlife conservation. But then it kind of changed really quickly right towards the end of my degree when I went to Australia. You were finishing up your degree and you took this trip to Australia. And yeah. was it the distance or was it a new experience? It was you... a new experience. Yeah. So I was taking courses in marine management mm-hmm. instead of marine biology. Mm-hmm. And so the perspective was really different. I was learning about indigenous perspectives, political issues, mm-hmm. social issues, and it was... Um, an awakening for me, um, that that's what I really wanted to focus on. And that's what my heart was really in. Because at the time, I was also really struggling with my biology degree, not academically, but just personally, discovering management as a field, Mm -hmm. and all the questions that come up in that space made me realize that that's exactly where I wanted to go. And so then, you know, obviously, through the thesis work, you start to really figure out what what that's all about. But uh, yeah. yeah. Tell me a little bit more about your your trip to Australia. So it was in Coffs Harbour. But it's an amazing place because you have the marine life from the south and from the Great Barrier Reef Mm -hmm. in that area. So I also learned to scuba dive there. Um, So it was also, you know, there were some biological (laughs) learning things going on at the same time as learning about... um, Indigenous perspectives and issues and um, economics and, yeah. you know, more broad social themes. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was the start of a long relationship with Australia because that's where I went back for my master's. Right. Yeah. I'm curious about the Indigenous perspectives from another sort of colonial yeah. country. 
was it, I mean, I, I know it was, a, it was a sort of a new um, angle for you personally, but did yep. you feel like there was a new relationship to Indigenous people that came from that? A new relationship for myself or just yeah. like, um, it's interesting thinking retrospectively about these things because coming from Winnipeg, mm-hmm. I mean, growing up in the city and going to urban public schools, it's like a lot of my friends were Indigenous, you right? And mm-hmm. But I, I wasn't always thinking on those terms, like you're Indigenous, I'm not Indigenous, yeah. you know? And so I guess I became more aware of the factors that were that were causing inequities yeah. through that experience. And it's very mirrored on either side of the ocean, right? Yeah. It's, well, all over the world, actually, you know, yeah. we, we see what colonization does. And, you know, obviously there's a disenfranchisement that happens to folks in similar ways everywhere. You brought that perspective back to Winnipeg yeah. and you finished your degree or, did, yeah, you finished your degree at the University of Winnipeg then? I did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I did uh, an honors with DFO. Okay. Um, that was... Department of Fisheries and Oceans yeah, Department in Winnipeg. Of, in Winnipeg. Can you yeah. explain that to us coastal people for just a For minute? sure. So Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Winnipeg, they have a big center there and they focus on the north as well as freshwater. Right. Um, so my thesis w- was with the Freshwater Institute, and okay. I really wanted to do a management thesis, but in the biology department, it's really hard to do that. Sure. So I had to do a classic biology study with a bit of a management bent to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was comparing agricultural streams that had riparian buffer zones, so vegetation mm-hmm. al- along um, the banks, to comparing those to those that did not have. Just cut through the farm. Field. Yeah, there's cows yeah. walking through, yeah. you know, like that kind of thing. I didn't love it. It wasn't my favorite thesis, <laughs> you know, because it was entomology thesis. Okay. Essentially, I was looking at bugs through a microscope yeah. for months and months, counting them. And it's cool the first few times you sure. see, you know, these little things blown up and you're like, wow, these are amazing. But then yeah. after, you know, 10,000, you're a bit <laughs> over it. I'm sorry to the entomology people, but that's how I felt. <laughs> now, I do, I am a little curious because you mentioned your mom went to university when you were a kid. Yeah. Okay. And how close was that to, like, was that in high school or when you in elementary school? Or? I was in elementary, yeah. So was that, an, was that like the example that you were definitely going to go to university, like to follow her? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it had an influence. I would say it had more of an influence on my creative side of things and kind of where I am now. Okay. Uh, or, I mean, it started with my master's that I started using arts-based okay. approaches. And my mom's degree was in human ecology. Okay. And she focused on costume design. Yeah. So I grew up around sketches and art supplies. And that's what really piqued my interest in, yeah. in that. Yeah. Um, choosing to go to university, I think it was more that I wanted to be an agent for change. Okay. And education seemed like the clearest path for me to sure. to get there. Do you have yeah. siblings? I have a sibling. They identify as trans. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also a scientist or no um oh, hang into... on a second. do you consider yourself a scientist that's such a good question <laughs> um i have a hard times with ists and isms yeah so i mean if i had to answer it on a job interview i would say yes because i do social science yeah um but i feel like that's not how i always approach questions mm-hmm And similarly with the arts, like I'm into art making, but I don't call myself an artist. Yes. Because I think it's just the ist that is so... Uh, I think we're all artists. I think so too, right? Yeah, Yeah. in different ways. And I mean, science science is a discipline and it has Mm -hmm. to be learned and it's all about verification and validity and all those things, right? And I completely respect it. And I guess it's one of the many hats that I wear. That I'm comfortable with. Right. But I I couldn't be like, I'm a scientist. That's my only, you know, identity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess when when you bring people into the question, this idea that science can have the answer is not always correct, right? Yeah. It's a hard thing to... I think I don't often look for answers either in my research, which I think is strange. Maybe a little different. And maybe why sometimes I get invited to collaborate with people because they, they like that as a unique approach, Mm -hmm. that it's more about further inquiry or understanding um, the gray zones that exist and bringing a bit of light to that. Because I think sometimes when we're looking for 
the answer, we miss a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think and that's what most art practice is about, right? Exactly. It's about exploring ideas rather than hypothesizing and answering. Yeah. Things like emotions. Mm-hmm. Yet yeah, there's no clear answers around them, but they're still really important. Yeah. Um, we make decisions based on emotion, whether we choose to admit right. it or not. Yeah. Yeah. So you had this very transformative experience in yep. Australia. You finished your undergrad degree at the University of Winnipeg, yep. downtown, That's and right. you decided to go to grad school. How easy was mm-hmm. that decision? I took a year okay. just to figure out exactly where I wanted to go. I was feeling yeah, out a few... backpacked yeah. around Europe. No, sorry. <laughs> no, I just worked. <laughs> I just worked a bunch of jobs to make money. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then I decided to go to University of Manitoba. I was also looking at uh, Lakehead and Thunder Bay, right. but... Uh, Fikret Burkus is at um, U of M, and I just really respected his research program and thought he would be a great advisor to work with. And it turned yeah. out to be very true. He was um, very encouraging of um, using the arts in, in research, right. and so um, that was obviously a really good fit, mm-hmm. um, but then also knew about my experience in Australia and had a colleague, uh, Helen Ross, in Australia and thought, hmm... Maybe we can make something happen there, and Melanie could go back and do her uh, master's research there, which is exactly what happened, and it was it was great. And this time, you chose your research a little more carefully, I think. Yeah, of, oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I didn't feel kind of like forced into it. Yeah. It was. And what did the research end up being? I worked with the Giringen Aboriginal Corporation, um, and they were focusing on the establishment of the first Indigenous protected area over both land and sea jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And they also had their ranger unit, Aboriginal ranger unit, that was doing a lot of um, work on country. That's, you know, how people talk about it in Australia, on on the land and sea. Um, And so I focused my research on questions around the development of the Indigenous protected area and how the ranger unit um, was facilitating that development uh, and relationship building between the people in Giringen and the folks from government. Mm -hmm. And then, interestingly, right next to the land and sea management building was the Giringen Aboriginal Arts Centre. And so this is where the art space component came into it because it was just such a good fit And I was really interested in this term that was being used a lot, caring for country, and had been, I would say, and uh, other folks would say, co-opted by the federal government for their programming. Mm -hmm. But I really wanted to know what did caring for country mean from the Giringen perspective, because it's the way they would speak about country. Mm -hmm. So uh, through the arts, we, we explored that. Yeah. And uh, there's a huge painting, it's in my office right now, yeah. that was uh, the result of that. And uh, a number of traditional owners uh, participated on that painting, young and old, mm-hmm. some professional artists, some novice artists or uh, budding artists. And uh, yeah. And then when it was all done, I was like, well, where are you going to put it? You know, are you going <laughs> to hang this somewhere in the office? And they were like, nope. Art doesn't stay here. You're now the uh, the uh, steward of that art yeah. uh, for as long as you have it, and um, that means that you know you're responsible for sharing sharing the story. So, yeah. so thank you for another opportunity <laughs> for being able to share the story yeah. of what they were doing there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And so you finished that up. Yep. And decide to continue on. Mm-hmm. PhD. You must have learned a lot in this process about defining yeah. a project. And it's interesting you said earlier that you're not always looking for answers. So I imagine mm-hmm. that the thesis or the report that comes out of this work has, is complex and nuanced and has a lot. You got to read the whole thing. Not yeah, just the, exactly. Not just the paragraph. The abstract. The end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how did that help you define your PhD work? Yeah, so I still had a lot of questions about relationships and reconciliation and Indigenous governance, really, and yeah. how Indigenous groups and peoples can can find sovereignty, basically. I considered going back to Australia. My grandparents' health was declining, and mm-hmm. I thought, well, I really should stay here in Canada a bit closer to home. So um, there was this opportunity 
to join the Common Ground Research Forum, a okay. big funded project um, in northwestern Ontario. So that's that's where I did it, and it was around um, forest governance, mm-hmm. uh, shared tenure in uh, northwestern Ontario around okay. Kenora. And what sort of work came out of that, both, you know, yeah. written and, and creative? <laughs> yeah, so it's actually started with the creative part, which was a project that I was doing as a, a course during my master's that then bridged to the PhD. Mm-hmm. I worked with the Lake of the Woods Arts Collective um, on a project that was exploring what shared land means from multiple mm-hmm. perspectives. So um, what resulted in that after you know exploring through a few focus groups was that the people in the community wanted to make a collaborative art piece. And there was a glass studio in town mm-hmm that offered to be the hub for that. So a big collaborative mosaic was Mm -hmm. created and about 90 to 100 people worked on it and etched in their their thoughts and images about what shared land means. There was also an installation uh, that was created with poetry and symbols and then it culminated in an event that was at the museum, the Lake of the Woods Museum. And the final piece of that was a short documentary about the whole thing, okay. uh, interviewing people, asking them about, you know, their perspectives for that. And yeah, yeah. that was that was the beginning of it. And then yeah. it went into the more technical side of things where yeah. I was talking to people in forestry and it, mm-hmm. it became kind of clear to me that like arts based approaches with these <laughs> folks was not a good fit. <laughs> so that was more your classic interviewing sure. and asking about themes around shared governance, learning because mm-hmm. I use that as a theoretical lens, transformative learning and reconciliation. Yeah. And like once you have, so it's interesting, you have these two pieces of art that you've put yeah. together collaboratively with multiple contributors from all different kind of walks of the, the issue that's surrounding the creation of it. Yeah. Is it a predictable process at all or is it totally hmm. unpredictable? Totally. It's a bit unpredictable. Yeah. Yeah. It is. You have to be really open Yeah. and kind of trust it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but mm-hmm. trust the process yeah. and trust the people you're working with. Yeah. It will be so much better if you do. Sure. Like if you try and control it too much, it, it just it, it falls flat, which mm-hmm. I think is like what art is like in general. Yeah. Yeah. I whether so. it's personal or collaborative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the things that came out of my PhD was the importance of listening to youth Mm -hmm. in those contexts, um, which is not something that I went in with, like in my objectives, like what do you think about this? Um, But the entire industry or the assumptions around the industry and the the new ways of doing forestry in the area Mm -hmm. were really um, grounded on this idea that young indigenous folks were going to be the forestry workers in the area. And then you talk to people from those communities and they're like, no, they don't want to, (laughs) you know, (laughs) they want to go into like totally different fields. And there are good reasons for them not wanting to go into forestry. They have to be away from home for a long time. And, and so then it gets really interesting because you look into like all these assumptions that people have Mm -hmm. about communities, like, oh, you know, we provided all these training opportunities for these young Anishinaabe folks and they didn't come, you know, they just didn't come and take those opportunities and didn't finish their programs, right? And it's like, there's a lot of negative rhetoric that comes with that. But then when you actually talk to people from communities, they're like, it was just not suited for these young people. They have right. they have their own goals, right? They have their own ambitions. And if anybody had just taken the time to talk mm-hmm. to them, they could have changed the program, make it more appealing, sure. or who knows, right? Yeah. Totally different outcomes. So yeah, that that's an example of the less predictable mm-hmm. things that come out of those types of studies. And they come out from listening to communities and making that space for for folks to answer questions on their own terms and not being super structured in in a in a guide you yeah. know for example yeah are those the kind of surprises that dictate the design of new projects for you <laughs> absolutely yeah. yeah so that was the start of really looking into um what you think and it's still a theme in my research now mm-hmm. So going back to a bit of biographical part of it, mm-hmm. um, so you finished your PhD, and was mm-hmm. it clear what you were going to do next? 
I really wanted to be a prof, not because I, I like revere academia, but yeah. I think because I, uh, I had such a good experience, uh, with my research groups that I worked with. And yeah. I, I loved the, the mix of folks from all over the world working together and exploring different questions. And I considered NGO work at one mm-hmm. point, but then I decided to really commit yeah. to finding an academic job because <laughs> yeah. you have to because they're so few and far between yeah um so what did that process look like going after jobs and, and yeah. figuring out what you wanted to do building a, a research program um well there was the postdoc and the well so right after my phd i worked in roberta woodgate's lab and that felt a lot like a postdoc because yeah. i was doing a lot of writing and research um but it, it was a research associate position and that was in the faculty of health, which is, it feels like a bit of like a, you know, veering sure. off, but, um, uh, because she was doing arts based approaches with youth, yeah. it was a great place to, to keep exploring those themes. Um, and then the postdoc back at UW, UW Winnipeg. So mm-hmm. it's like the salmon full circle, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with Ryan Bullock's research group there was the, the final position I had to take while I was applying for, for jobs and got this one at Dal. Yeah. And it hasn't been that long, right? It's been five, five. years since you've yeah. been here. So uh, what's your impression so far? It's been great, you know, <laughs> like, especially working at for Srez uh, in yeah. the College of Sustainability. They've been really supportive of my kind of unusual questions that I ask in research and, and see it as a strength and... I've always felt very accepted. Yeah. And lots of interesting projects, as you know, David. I know. <laughs> that we're yeah. on one together. We have a project together, yeah. full disclosure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How have you decided what questions you want to explore? And also geographically, now that mm-hmm. you're in a, a different place, um, have you been focusing on things that are relevant to here or still thinking globally? Yeah. Both local and global, mm-hmm. for sure. Um, so An example of a local project would be um, one that I have with the Unamagi Institute for Natural Resources. Um, That probably wouldn't have happened had I not been here. We were working together through the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership. And because of my location, I was paired with Lisa Young from UINR to Mm -hmm. be their governance stream lead. And so through that relationship, then it led to our new project. So there's an example of... um, one local initiative, but there's, there's others, you know, and, um, but that's up in Cape Breton. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what the sort of outcomes that you're hoping for are? For sure. So it's, um, it's research about research, Mm -hmm. um, which is also unusual, (laughs) but, uh, I think very important. And so obviously indigenous organizations are invited to be partners in research all the time, Mm -hmm. probably, more than they like to be, yeah. you know, because it's very burdensome. Um, and this project is aiming to develop further the principles for engagement with UINR, mm-hmm. but in a way that it will be useful for other Indigenous organizations too. Just from your preliminary work, what do you think the biggest barriers for scientists mm. um, are in collaborating properly? Or yeah, the best way. Well, with that particular project, it's right at the beginning, right. so we haven't really started. You know, we yeah. have our ethics in hand, <laughs> so I can't can't tell you Not much more than that. Question, but but uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, the project that we're a part of, right? Yeah. Um, Sustainable Nunatsiavut Futures is also exploring that, um, at least in our little research group, work package one, or whatever yeah. you want to call it. And I think it comes in the defining of the question, uh, the scoping of the question and objectives right Right. from the start. And I I try as much as I can to follow um, what's called a boundary work approach, uh, which aims to involve or not just involve, involve is the wrong word, but really collaborate with community partners right from the beginning. Often in all kinds of research, not just natural science, the objectives are kind of gelled already. Yeah. And then, okay, now we need a community partner. So we're going to reach out. Hey, totally. community organization, is this a thing you're interested in? Okay, now let's initiate collaboration, right? Mm-hmm. I try and back up a yeah. bit and talk to folks that I think there'll be 
you know, obviously things in common and, and something to explore um, to figure out if there's an objective that can be created together. And I think because of the way universities are, that that's really challenging for most researchers. Can you tell me a little bit more about this Sustainable Nanazi Futures project and what, what yeah. it encompasses? For sure. So it's a partnership between uh, the Nazi government, mm -hmm. um, Dalhousie and Memorial University. It started with four work packages, and those are still intact, I would say, for all intents and purposes. But there's a real desire uh, from a lot of folks to sort of collapse them to make more interdisciplinary connections. So mm -hmm. that's one of the big aims in the project is interdisciplinarity. So understanding... Um, northern coastal issues from so social perspectives, yeah. natural perspectives. I'm trying to bring in the arts-based yeah. approaches. I would say in a nutshell, what it's trying to do is change the way science is done in the north, mm -hmm. which is what we've been talking about, really. Um, which And it's not an easy task mm -hmm. to do that in four years. Uh, <laughs> you know, to do it from a really grassroots yeah. kind of uh, approach. So my sense is that there's going to be a lot of great outcomes from this project, but people will need to stay committed. That if people go, this was too hard, <laughs> you know, this was too hard for science, this was yeah. too hard for collaboration, that a lot will be lost from those outcomes. So one of the things that I think is quite interesting is about your timeline and the right time. Hmm. And I want to know how the larger movement of reconciliation has oh, yeah. played into how you think about doing your research or, mm -hmm. how, you know. Mm, that's a really good question. When I was doing my PhD work, the calls to action were being released. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of momentum around that. Yeah. Especially with Winnipeg being kind of a hub for it. Yeah. With the Center for Truth and Reconciliation. And I was working with some of the folks there on a edited volume and that kind of thing. So in a practical sense... Yeah, but I always had these questions in the back of my mind about, is this enough? Is this, is this the right process? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be enough to carry it forward? Because reconciliation doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing process. It's, it's something you just have to be committed to and, and constantly trying to be aware and self-reflexive. And now I think... In Canadian society, we're like, okay, we have the calls to action, which are very important because they come from the survivors mm -hmm. and from communities, and that can never be diminished. Mm -hmm. But, or not a but, an and, <laughs> we need to keep thinking about what does it mean and what next, and new discoveries, you know, finding of uh, children mm -hmm. buried around residential schools, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, survivors were talking about that for a long time and yeah. then it only hit the media when there was scientific evidence for it mm -hmm. so people need to keep listening mm -hmm. so relatedly what role do you think scientific and particularly the natural sciences mm -hmm. should they play in reconciliation the questions and the way forward should come from communities mm -hmm. And folks and institutions should be willing to help, you know, rather than like, oh, Melanie Zerba at Dalhousie is interested in this yeah. thing. At, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's then it's coming sort of from the wrong place. I mean, it can happen collaboratively. It can be sure. like you have a relationship and you figure out questions together. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But I th I'm really into service research, I yeah. guess, is what you could maybe call it, yeah. um, where... We have all these great resources. We have students. Yeah. We have yeah. money. We have labs. We have so much infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And if we can put ourselves in a position to help communities with that, then I think research yeah. is going in the right direction. Yeah. A very interesting discussion. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks for having me. It was great to be here. And uh, it's always fun sharing about research, but also going back into the past and sharing some of those uh, pivotal moments. In our next episode, we'll talk to Dr. Aaron Newman, a 
cognitive neuroscientist. His research aims to understand how different language experiences shape the brain. If you're enjoying Sographies, hit subscribe, give us a rating. I'm your host, David Barkley. Thanks for listening. Sographies is brought to you by Dalhousie University's Faculty of Science and CKDU 88.1 